Hi, I'm your host, Dee Dee Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Acoustics with Jay Fergoletto. This multi-part series is an overview of acoustic topics. For a more in-depth look, we highly recommend Jay Fergoletto's book and courses. Jay is an award-winning veteran mastering engineer who has owned high-end mastering studios in Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Boston. His clients have included Alice in Chains, Annie DeFranco, Oasis, India Ari, Black Eyed Peas, Blondie, In Excess, and many more. Albums that Jay has mastered have earned a Grammy Award, as well as gold and multi-platinum record awards. He is an accomplished pianist and multi-instrumentalist. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. Hi, it's Jay Frigoletto for Audio Builders Workshop, continuing our series of talks on acoustics. Uh, let's talk about large room acoustics. Uh, again, we touched on what's the difference between the m behavior, uh, especially the modal behavior for low frequencies in large rooms versus small rooms. Things that are the size of concert halls versus things that are the size of recording studios. Uh, and again, we learned that the big difference is what happens in the low frequency area, 300 hertz and below, maybe even up to four or 500 hertz if you're in a, a much smaller room. Um, and the fact that you've got these room modes or standing waves that are causing uh, these, uh, this erratic response in the room. Um, so let's talk about large rooms for a bit. What do we need to think about in, in a large room? If you're dealing with uh, a concert hall, a recital hall, uh, even for that matter, a multi-purpose theater. Um, so the biggest thing that happens when you're dealing with indoor acoustics and you've got these boundaries, walls, ceiling, floor, you've got energy from whatever your direct sound source is. It could be a person speaking, it could be the orchestra, it could be musicians, whatever it is. Uh, this sound emanates, this direct sound from that source, encounters a boundary, a wall, a ceiling, a floor, um, bounces back. Of course, some of it also could be absorbed, some of it could transmit, but the part that bounces back, that's reflected back, is the part that we're interested in right now. Um, so after an impulse, a sound, uh, the sound energy doesn't just go and disappear, it remains in the room over time. Uh, you have all these multiple reflections combining into this dense field uh, that we know as reverberation, or sometimes we shorten it just as reverb. Um, this, um, one of the things to know about these reverberations, this reverb, is that it's not the same at all frequencies. Um, depending on what the room geometry is, the shape of the room, sort of walls angled or not, uh, whether it's complex, is it L-shaped, is there a wing, what's the story? Um, also, what are, what are the surfaces like? Are they very, very hard and dense? Are they soft and flexible? Do they have absorption on them? Uh, are they very regular and somewhat diffuse? So all of these sorts of um, variations contribute to how the sound is going to reverberate. Uh, and also the amount of absorption or the amount of sound that can transmit. Again, in a flimsy little, you know, simple wall, a lot of the low frequency information will just transmit right through it. It's not gonna bounce back. It's not a massive enough uh, barrier to reflect that energy. Um, you have a very, very massive barrier. It takes a lot of energy to get that thing excited and use that energy to go through it and get to the other side. Uh, so if you've got a very massive thing, that energy isn't going to simply just pass right through it. It's going to be reflected back. So you've got a very thick, dense wall. A lot of that low frequency stuff is coming back to you. So depending on all of those factors, the reverb time can be wildly different uh, in the low frequencies versus the high versus the mid. Um, and when we're Measuring things generally in all of acoustics, whether it's you know the transmission, the reflection, all of those things, we're going to measure it in octave bands. Uh, an octave, of course, uh, imagine if you're a musician on a piano, you've got this C, and then you've got the next C up and the octave up. So da ba ba, that's an octave. In frequency speak, every time you go up an octave, you're doubling that frequency. So when you talk about the octave bands. 
Um, usually they start uh, around 60, or if you really want to be good about it, uh, 62 and a half. <laughs> uh, 125, 250, 500, 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, 8 kilohertz, 16 kilohertz. Again, notice that each one of these doubles. 250, the next band is 500. From 500, the next one is 1K, 1 kilohertz, 1,000 hertz. Then 2K, then 4, then 8, then 16. Uh, so again, you're moving up. Now, the octave bands, when you talk about those frequencies, that's the center of the band. So the 500 hertz band, the center of that band is 500, and it's a certain width to either side of that. Range of frequencies centered on 500 in that octave. Um, so when you hear the most basic um, sort of, when someone cites a reverb time, uh, if it's a single number, it's probably based in the mid-range. Maybe it's an average of 501 k maybe 501 k and 2K, but not very high, not very low. Um, say you've got a reverberation time, you know, how long does it take that sound to decay uh, of, you know, 1.2 seconds. Uh, great, if that's measured just at 501 kilohertz, you don't know what's going on elsewhere. Down at 125, you could have it be twice as long, three times as long. There might be certain individual frequencies that um, are very discrete and ring for four seconds. Who knows? Um, so you can't really just take it on faith that uh, that single number uh, is really going to tell you the whole story. Um, so this reverb time, let's talk about reverberation briefly. What is it uh, when you talk about the time? Uh, they call it T60 or RT60, the time for the sound to decay 60 decibels of sound pressure level uh, below the initial impulse. What that really means is for the sound to diminish to one millionth of its initial intensity. That's what a 60 dB decrease is. It's one millionth of the initial intensity. Um, that is your T60 or RT60. And again, if you really want to know the full uh, picture of a room, you're going to take that measurement in individual octave bands and see what's happening at high frequencies, see what's happening at low, see what's happening in the middle. Um, when you want to control the sound in a room, um, for a good sounding room for musical performance, um, sure, the, the low frequency reverb times are always going to be a little bit longer, but you don't want them to be twice as long, three times as long, four times as long. Um, so. And it's also much easier to absorb high frequency. If you've got some drapes, you've got something soft on the wall, it can be absorbing all of the high frequency stuff and letting all of the low frequency stuff go. You've got this little bit of fuzzy insulation on the wall, little small wavelengths are gonna be frictionally absorbed. They're gonna, no problem, they're gonna get knocked out. Big, big wavelengths are just gonna go through that little skinny piece of fuzz like it's not even there and bounce off whatever the massive boundary is behind it, uh, come back into the room. So um, controlling your sound at different octave bands is an important thing to consider. So let's talk about absorption and how to calculate absorption. When sound energy is going to encounter that boundary, such as a wall, something's going to get reflected back. Uh, we talked about in an earlier talk about the um, reflection coefficient, Greek letter rho, uh, the um, Transmission, how much goes through the wall, represented uh, by Greek letter tau, and then also the absorption, Greek letter alpha. Um, so, again, 100% of the sound, or one unit of sound, 1.0, the reflection plus the absorption plus the transmission equals one. So, any of this, um, any of these coefficients uh, will be a number that is less than one. So if you have 50% of the sound is reflected back, well then your reflection coefficient will be 0.5. Uh, so half of that sound energy, 50% is coming back. Um, maybe you have 0.25, you know, a quarter of it is being absorbed, a quarter of it is being transmitted. Whatever it is, those three pieces need to add up to one. Um, so for the absorption, um, the Biggest thing about what, well, how will sound reflect? Of course, the mass of that boundary. Um, and then absorption can happen in a lot of different ways as well. Uh, we think of, you know, the soft, fuzzy stuff. 
the fiberglass, the carpet, the drapes, uh, things like that. That really will absorb mid frequencies and high frequencies. Um, it's also what's called a velocity absorber uh, because it has to do with the velocity of these particles uh, that are rubbing against all of these sort of nooks and crannies in the material, causing friction, being dissipated as heat. Um, porous absorption, they call it. So the other kind of uh, absorption, or one other kind of absorption, would be flexural, uh, something that flexes. Uh, this could be a control room window. This could be a piece of plywood, a panel. This is drywall all around you. The pieces of gypsum board that are like on your walls actually will flex and absorb. You think of those as being hard things, very reflective surfaces. Sure, at mid and high frequencies. At low frequencies, actually, these flexural absorbers tend to be more effective. Um, and then the last kind of absorption that happens is a resonant. Uh, this is sometimes when you have an opening and a cavity of air that will resonate uh, sympathetically with a certain frequency. And these tend to be narrower and narrower. Instead of wider bandwidths, you've got very narrow bandwidths, which you can actually tune, which is kind of cool. Um, of course, sometimes these narrow things resonate and absorb sound, but also re-emit a little because if they're not damped, in other words, you don't have any damping material, you don't put some fuzz inside that cavity, they can actually re-emit a little bit at that frequency as well. So it will absorb some of that ring, but then ring a little bit on its own, so it's not controlling as much as you want. Um, the other part of absorption, um, when you're trying to figure out that, uh, or to figure out a reverb time, is um, not only do you need to know the absorption, but you need to know the actual volume of the space. The larger the space, the longer those paths coming back, the longer that reverb time is going to be until you start putting up absorption, which shortens that reverb time. And of course, the famous Sabian equation is the one that calculates that. And I tell you what, we're going to wait till the next installment and we're going to go through all of these large room things like the Sabian equation and room constant critical distance. Uh, so if you like large room acoustics, check back for that one. Again, Jay Frigoletto for Audio Builders Workshop. Be back soon.